Hey everyone, this is Stefan. So great to be with you guys today. Uh, it's been a while since I've been live here on YouTube. And so I wanted to put together this coaching Q&A where um, I want to make myself available for you guys in the next hour or so, just for whoever joins in, sees this live. Um, let me know anything I can help you guys with. Let me know how I can be of service to you in your life. If there's uh, specific questions that you have for me or challenges or obstacles or goals that you're trying to pursue and achieve, um, you know, I'm happy to share with you guys my expertise, my experience, anything that I can to support you guys uh, with whatever it is that you guys need help with. So if you're joining in right now live, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, please post in the chat. Let me know your name, where you're joining in from. Uh, I'll give some shout outs here today. And then, of course, uh, throw out some questions, any questions that you guys have. And I'll do the best that I can to answer as many as I possibly can uh, in the next hour or two. Uh, one thing I want to mention too, as we got people joining in, um, uh, I've getting been getting some questions about cryptocurrency, and we can talk about crypto. We can talk about you know the stock market. We can talk about whatever you guys are interested in. Um, uh, but for those of you that are interested in crypto and been asking me about it, um, there's a free training I mentioned before about my crypto bots and you know some of my experience with crypto. Uh, Dan Hollings is the person that I've been learning from, and he has this program called The Plan, and he's making it available again for a short period of time. There's a webinar we're putting on Saturday. So if you guys want to learn more about that, I threw a link in the description for you guys so that you guys can check that out. So um, check out that link or go to projectlifemastery.com slash crypto, and you can learn more about the webinar trainings and more information about that. Okay, with that being said, how about we dive in? Let's see who's joining in here in the comments. Cool. We got Kimmy here from Venice, Florida. Welcome. We got Essen from Montreal. Great. Uh, Yeshua from Miami, Florida. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, hey, Molly. And we got Lily from Italy. Great. I was just in Italy in September for about two weeks. Uh, Tatiana and I uh, went to Rome, went to uh, Florence, uh, went to Pompeii, which is pretty amazing. The history there is just so incredible. And then we spent some time in Positano, Sorrento, Amalfi, and Capri. So it was a really beautiful country. Uh, all right, we've got Jonathan here from Austin, Texas. Welcome. We've got Moise from Rwanda. Very cool. Welcome. we got Shay from London. Oh, wow, I've been a follower for over five years. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the support. Uh, we got Pedro from Mexico. Awesome. Welcome. We got Keith from New Jersey. You got Tony from North Carolina. Uh, you got Crystal from Texas. Daniel from Slovakia. Dennis from Jamaica. Awesome. We've got people from all over. Um, Essen's asking if this is only going to be available on YouTube. So yes, this recording should be available for you guys afterwards. If you guys uh, can't uh, stick around for the whole duration, you guys can watch the replay. And we got Van from South Africa. We got Tony from Dallas. We got. Yetin from uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. It's always a joy to be with you guys and to share, um, you know, share this experience of life together. And hopefully we can make this worthwhile and I can uh, share some things with you guys that can uh, possibly enhance your life. Okay, so let's dive into some questions now. Um, all right, let me see. I'm going to try to, you know, when I do these Q&As, although there's so many different questions from many different many different angles and many different topics and whatnot. I, I try to always um, take into consideration that I want to try to take on questions that I think could be relevant for the majority of people here. So I might, you know, if your question is a little bit too technical or specific on something, I may still answer it, but I, I primarily want to make sure this is valuable for everybody as much as I can. Um, but um, one question here is from Raisa, Raisa, Raisa. Hi, Stefan. Are you not posting as many YouTube videos as before? <laughs> uh, you'd be correct. That's a correct observation. Um, so I'm not publishing nearly as much as I used to. You know, I've been a YouTuber now for over 10 years. So I'm a dinosaur when it comes to, um, you know, this sort of thing. And I've published over a thousand videos here on my YouTube channel. And uh, there was definitely times, you know, along my journey of trying to build a YouTube channel where I was really focused on growing my channel, getting subscribers, getting views. You know, that's obviously part of the game and part of being a YouTuber. Uh, I remember, you know, a number of years ago when I was publishing five videos in a week, you know, that was my goal and my standard five videos in a week. And then, 
And I realized that was a little bit too much. And I kind of scaled that back a little bit to four in a week and then three in a week and two in a week and one in a week. And now I'm kind of at a point where um, I'm not following a specific schedule for YouTube. Uh, I've been able to let go of a lot of this pressure I think that I've had for a long time of being a YouTuber of just making sure I publish every single week. And so what I've kind of uh, allowed myself to do now is just I want to publish more organically rather than forcing myself every week, think of a video topic, you know, um, put something out there just for the sake of putting it out there. I want to make sure that I'm uh, authentic to, um, you know, what's important to me. And so, you know, I want to share things organically as they come up. If there's something I want to share, great, I'll share it. Otherwise, I don't really want to force myself anymore every single week to put out a video on whatever topic. And I don't really care at this stage either to try to chase subscribers or views. Um, you know, I know that if I want to get more views or more subscribers or whatever it is, I know the topics, I know the headlines, I know the thumbnails, I know the game of that. But sometimes I feel like that is just a bit inauthentic in some ways, I think, because I want to make sure that I maintain my integrity and my passion for what I do. And the only way I can really do that is to make sure that I'm sharing organically, sharing what I feel, sharing what I feel and believe is important and sharing things that I think are also a bit relevant for me as well. Um, there's some topics that I might not really publish on as much as I used to. And that's mostly just because I'm not that interested in them as much. I'm not as focused on business as much as I used to. I'm not focused on success as much as I used to. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to kind of go back and create a video on these topics because they kind of feel like kind of like newbie type of topics. And I feel like the work that I do on myself is more, a little bit more advanced than some of these topics. And I feel like I'm just kind of a bit beyond that. So the challenge I think of being a content creator is there's always this balance where of course you have to do what is useful for your audience. If you want your audience to remain intact, following you, subscribe to you, interested in what you have to say. So you have to put their needs most often above your own if you want to get subscribers and views. But the challenge with that is that's not always sustainable, especially if you've been doing this for over 10 years, because how often, you know, it, it can kind of wear on you a little bit talking about the same things again and again and again after 10 years when you've kind of moved beyond it. So there's that balance where you also have to share things that um, I'm passionate about and I'm interested in and things that I want to share. And so there's kind of that balance that has to be maintained at different times. So, um, but yeah, I guess the, 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 you know, shorter answer to your question is, yeah, I'm just going to publish a bit more casually now and, um, take, you know, some more breaks from time to time. And, uh, yeah, just try to make sure when I do share something, it's, you know, hopefully valuable for everybody. <clears throat> okay. All right. This is from Dr. Daniel Miza. How can I become a successful YouTuber? Sure. That's a great question just to piggyback on what I just said. So I think when you're first starting out as any influencer or YouTuber, you have to identify what people want. You know, you have to, you know, you, you have to identify what do people want? What are they interested in? What are their goals? What are they searching for? What are their problems and challenges? And essentially what you're trying to do is identify the niche that you are going to create videos on and position yourself in. Uh, when I first started Project Life Mastery back in 2012, what I originally started to do was I went pretty general and broad. You know, I decided at first I was sharing my goals with everybody to be accountable to it. I started sharing, I was doing a fitness competition. So I started sharing my progress and, you know, my journey there. But I was primarily just kind of sharing a variety of videos on things that I was interested in, things that I was learning. I shared my morning routine, shared, you know, things I learned about belief systems. And what happened was as you're kind of publishing on different topics on YouTube, you identify that there's certain videos and certain topics that do really well. So a lot, you know, maybe they go viral. A lot of people watch it. You'll always have certain videos that get more views and more subscribers than others. And for me, I was originally kind of sharing my life and personal development stuff. And I shared this one video on how to make passive income online. That video did better than all my other videos. And so it kind of told me that this was something that people were interested in more than others. And so uh, if you have a video that uh, is doing really well, that attracts subscribers. And now probably the majority of your subscribers subscribe to you because they watch that one video and they subscribe because they want more on that topic. 
And so for me in my circumstance, I decided, okay, well, this is what people want. This is what the questions that people are you know, asking me for. They want more of this. So I'm going to publish more on this topic or that topic. You know, my morning ritual video did really well. So I did some more videos on morning rituals. So I think part of being a YouTuber is you put, you know, you throw shit against the wall. You see what sticks. You have to, um, you know, maybe try to go into it with a, a certain niche or something you want to position yourself as, but you also have to be open and look at what people are responding to and make sure that you're consistent with giving people what they want. Uh, an example also I can give you is um, the most popular video that I've done was an interview with Tatiana uh, a number of years ago. I think it's got over 5 million views, but the subject or the title was she makes 40,000 a month at 23 years old. And it was about her journey selling on Amazon and Shopify and the success that she was having. That video got over, I think, 5 million views and basically attracted for me um, like hundreds of thousands of new subscribers. So, you know, if, if I have like hundreds of thousands of new subscribers that subscribe to me from that video, it's because they want more on that topic. So if I just, you know, they subscribe because they're interested in selling on Amazon and I start doing videos on things that are not even relevant to that, then you're obviously going to, you know, lose those subscribers. So you still have to recognize, okay, these people, this is what they want and I still need to maintain and give them that. So a big part of growing a YouTube channel is having that awareness, looking at the data, looking at, you know, engaging with your subscribers to kind of, you know, find out what it is that they want and need. And, uh, you know, to be that person that can, uh, serve those people and, and, uh, give them a lot of value. So, um, that'd be my, my main tip for you is, you know, try to make it less about you and more about the people that you're trying to serve. And if you're always focused on trying to serve and support people, um, you know, people will always appreciate that. I think they'll come to you for more. Um, and you're, you're going to give more than, you know, more than other YouTubers in many ways. I, I think also just one more comment on this is that I think there's many different, as we've seen styles of YouTubers. Um, you know, there's people that are really good at just short form, you know, uh, you know, right to the point, you know, maybe they follow a script, heavily edited videos, and it's just boom, like really engages someone and gives them a lot of value. Um, there's other YouTubers that are more long form content, maybe more podcast style, uh, you know, not, you know, more unscripted, a little bit more authentic, you know, and that all also could do incredibly well. Um, you know, so there's, there's many different styles that one can have. I don't think there's one way of having success with YouTube. I think there's many different ways. And I think you got to identify what is your style? What is, what, what is it that makes you unique or different? Um, you know, things that I think for me that made me a little bit different was, um, for me, I've always kind of had this balanced approach towards life. I, I I've always been mindful of, you know, sharing with people and encouraging people to go towards success and make money and create passive income and financial freedom, but also making sure I'm teaching people the mindset, teaching people to, you know, make sure they take care of other aspects of their life. Um, you know, maybe being a bit more transparent than others, you know, especially early on for me, I started sharing my goals and my, you know, progress reports. So these are things that you, you kind of stand out and you're unique and you have your own style and you have to find that, I think, to have success as an influencer so that you stand out from everyone else out there. All right. All right, let's dive into some more questions. So if you're just joining in, welcome. We're doing a Q and a right now. So feel free to uh, post any questions or challenges or goals or whatever it is that I can support you guys with. Uh, okay. Uh, Tony says, what percent do you have in cash? I don't know the exact percentage right now, Tony, but it's quite significant. Um, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's not the majority of my money. I'd say if I were to guess, maybe it's 10% or something like that, but, uh, you know, still a significant amount of money, uh, right now for us, uh, we're sitting on a lot of cash for a few reasons. One, we're building a house right now in Panama and, uh, we actually decided to pay that all in cash. Uh, Panama is not quite the same as the U S or Canada when it comes to getting a mortgage, they have very high interest rates, um, to begin with. And they have all these, you know, weird kind of, 
penalty, like fees and things like that. Like I remember, you know, I talked to a few banks about uh, getting a mortgage in Panama and, you know, they even just to like start the mortgage, you have to like pay 15 grand or 20 grand or something like that. So from, you know, for us, it didn't really make sense. And uh, we decided to um, just pay it outright in cash. And um, that's something that, uh, yeah, just kind of gives you an, a little bit of extra peace of mind as well when you don't have a mortgage. Um, but we've been sitting on cash, uh, also for just the, you know, the upcoming recession that I think a lot of people think we're going to head into. And I think it's useful to have that, uh, flexibility financially. Um, so for me, I, I, I have been selling a few stocks that did really well. Like I've been selling, um, some of my, my oil, oil stocks that, you know, they do pay good dividends, but you know, just the gains and the appreciation of them. I decided to take those profits and, um, you know, either sit on that cash or, um, invest it just in the S and P 500. So I have been buying as you know, the market's been going down, but not really deploying all of my cash. I'm still kind of waiting. I think there'll be a lot of opportunities coming up, uh, later this year, next year. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the real estate market as well. Looking at some opportunities there. Um, you know, I might buy also an apartment in Panama City as well, because uh, where we're building our house, it's like two hours or so from Panama City, and uh, you know, there's time. You know, we're kind of like right on the beach and all that. But sometimes you want to go into the city, you know, just to you know hang out with people and whatnot. So we're also looking at some property there. So I think you know, yeah, sitting on cash is always you know a good idea, and especially at a time like this. Uh, where there will be, I think, a lot of opportunities you want to be able to jump on and take advantage of. All right. Uh, Simon says, Simon from UK, not really keen on crypto, but I have uh, come into a lump sum of money, six figures, and I wonder uh, what you would do with it investment-wise. All right. Great question, Simon. Well, congrats on coming into a great lump sum of money. Um, I think the number one goal when you uh, start making a lot of money or you inherit a lot of money is to make sure that you preserve it because whenever you have a lot of money, there's a lot of opportunities that come knocking on your door. You know, everybody wants to share with you this investment opportunity or whatever it is. And um, I think sometimes when you're in this mindset of, you know, trying to get rich quick, let's say, there's a lot of presentations and opportunities that sound really good but can can carry a lot of risk. And so I think first and foremost is just making sure that you mentally and emotionally adjust to having a large sum of money. For me, I've always tried to make sure that I keep that conservative mentality in many ways as I've made more money because I've seen a lot of people come into a lot of money and they just spend it all and they lose it. So, you know, for me, because I grew up not having money, my parents went through a bankruptcy. There was always, you know, fighting around finances in our house. Uh, for me, I kind of had this scarcity mentality and this very conservative approach to money that I've learned as I've made more money to kind of overcome and let go of some of that. But I still maintain some of that, that conservatism around my finances. And I think that's a useful approach. Now, in terms of where to put the money, um, I think you'd probably want to determine what percentage of it you want to maintain in cash for emergency situations, for even opportunities that could arise, especially over the next year or two. Um, I tend to follow just more on a conservative level the advice of a Warren Buffett. You know, Warren Buffett advocates uh, for most investors to put their money in the, the S and P five hundred index fund, like an ETF. Uh, the one that I've shared before is the Vanguard S&P 500 index. The ticker for that is VOO. Um, that trades on, uh, you know, the U S exchanges, but you know, you're in the UK, you can open up a, a brokerage account that can allow you to also invest in stocks in the U S exchanges or international exchanges. So Warren Buffett, you know, he recommends S and P 500 because, it rep represents the 500 biggest companies in the United States. The U.S. is the world's biggest economy. Uh, you know, throughout history, the track record's been about nine to ten percent returns every single year, and so you get a level of certainty with that. And um, uh, you're you're more diversified than investing in individual companies. Uh, Warren Buffett has said, you know, when he you know he passes away, you know, his family and whatnot, you know, is just going to leave the money in an S and P 500 index for them. So. 
I, I tend to agree with that advice. I don't think you can go wrong with that. Um, you know, because you're in the UK, you might be tempted to invest in companies in the UK or in Europe. You know, my case being from Canada to invest in Canada's economy. But, you know, Canada's economy is not nearly as good as the US economy. So for me, I try to make sure most of my exposure is in the United States. So I would look at putting a certain percent towards an S&P 500 index fund. Um, you know, maybe also consider some real estate, maybe find some other index funds that you might like. You know, I like, uh, you know, tech, the NASDAQ. Uh, so the, you know, the Vanguard Technology Index, VGT is another one that I like. Um, right now, you know, the, the S&P 500 is down, I think, 23% since the all-time high, or at least the start of this year. Uh, so you can, you know, you can buy at a good price right now, but I think things will continue to drop, you know, maybe by another 10% or so. So I always try to do some dollar cost averaging. I spread out my investment. I don't, you know, if you have six figures, I wouldn't put like a hundred thousand right away into it. Maybe put 20,000 in and kind of wait a little bit and spread, you know, spread out that investment over a period of time. But, uh, one other comment I'll say, uh, Simon is with crypto. Listen, whether you're keen on crypto or not. I wouldn't really think about it that way. I would be like, here's this new asset class that's gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. I don't even fully understand it. I don't know whether or not crypto is going to be the next big thing or it'll go to zero. But you're in a very unique time in the history of the world right now where this thing called blockchain has been invented and is gaining a lot of popularity. And the potential upside of that, in my opinion, is worth the risk. So what I would consider, recommend everyone, regardless of if you're into crypto or not, because I don't think there's a log logical enough reason not to do what I'm saying, which would be just to take a small amount of money, okay? You can decide what is you define as a small amount. Maybe it's a hundred bucks, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, whatever is an amount of money that you can afford to lose. I would take that, put it into you know Bitcoin or Ethereum or a few cryptos and just leave it, leave it. Just let it be. Wait a couple of years, see what happens with it. You know, if the people that are really into crypto and the, you know the the so-called experts and all that are right, then great. You know, a few years from now, that you know thousand bucks that you put in can be worth a lot more and get you, in some cases, much greater returns than the stock market or real estate or almost anything else out there. And you know, if it goes to zero, then fine. It's not going to really. Um, you know, it's money that you can afford to lose. It's money that's not really going to make that much of a difference. So for me, I take, I tend to take more of this, I don't know approach. I don't know what's going to happen with crypto. I tend to lean more towards it being a big part of our lives and part of our future, but I'm not willing to miss out on the potential opportunities that can occur. And I've already missed out to some extent because I, I got into crypto in 2017, but I even knew about it years before that and had opportunities to invest that I wish I just put whatever, if I put a hundred bucks in, you know, it'd be worth a couple thousand today, uh, even at the current uh, state of the market. So um, that's kind of the approach that I would take. And, you know, and then of course, if you want to learn more about crypto and, you know, you become more educated on it and everything, you can decide if you want to put more in it. But I don't think there's any reason for anybody not to at least put a little bit of money into it and, uh, you know, see what happens. All right, let's dive to some more questions here. Um, Arian says, lack of consistency is my problem. Life is what you make of it. I make my one uh, I make my one shift, I think, because of my bad habits. How can I change it? You know, bad habits and um, addictions even, these are these are um, you know, these are things that can take some time to change in some circumstances. Um, there's a lot of often a lot of resistance with the ego to make certain changes. And part of it, you know, the metaphor that I've often shared is like creating new habits or new momentum in your life is often like launching a rocket into space. When you launch a rocket into space, it's going to use 80% of its fuel fighting Earth's gravitational pull. So there's a lot of resistance with gravity and trying to get it out there. But once it gets out of the Earth's atmosphere, then that rocket doesn't require that much energy, doesn't require that much fuel. 
It's the same thing with making changes in one's life. Most often, yes, there's circumstances where people make a shift just like that. But for most people, they try to make a change and it's met with a lot of resistance. And you have to push through that. You have to exercise willpower, discipline, which are muscles that you cultivate. So you have to take action regardless of how you feel. I think that's the big challenge is emotions is what gets in the way for a lot of people because to be consistent in and of itself is quite a simple idea. You just do today what you, you know, want what you want to do, what you intend to do, and then tomorrow's a new day and you also do take action, the next day you take action, the next day you take action. Oftentimes what gets in the way is emotion. I don't feel like it. I'm tired, I'm lazy, I'm not motivated. Um, some sort of stressful situation came up or you feel some anxiety or whatever it is. You've got to cultivate your ability to tolerate first and foremost, those emotions, those uncomfortable emotions, and to be able to act regardless of how you feel. So that's something that you're going to have to work on. And of course you can address the emotions as well. So you can practice first and foremost, pushing yourself building those muscles to be able to act in spite of how you feel, which, you know, at some days you might not be successful with that, but over time you build the muscle and it becomes easier and easier and easier for you. And you're able to be someone that regardless of what's going on, you still move forward. You still take action while simultaneously also working on whatever it is causing this emotional distress, whatever it is causing this resistance within you. If it's anxiety, there are certain things you can do to address that anxiety. If it's depression, there's things you can do to address depression. If it's a lack of motivation, there's things you can do to address, you know, the lack of motivation. If it's just this, you know, resistance that comes up like a limiting belief or some sort of inner conflict that's preventing you from doing it, there's things that you can do to address that. You can even practice the letting go technique, which I did a video on uh, a few months ago. That's, you know, my go-to for, letting go of and, and kind of releasing certain emotions and uh, resistance that I might have. So, so I think those two things, Arian, would be the approach that I would take. You're not, you're not always going to have an ideal circumstance for you to take action. You can't expect every day to be perfect and, you know, easy for you to take action. Some days are going to be rough and tough. And that's where it comes down to your resilience to be able to push beyond that. And then, of course, you can make it easier for you as well by addressing your emotional and spiritual well-being, which will uh, allow you to be more consistent and move forward in your life. Okay, uh, Caroline says, advice in what to invest during the next 12 months considering the current world situation. For me, um, yeah, for me, what I've been primarily investing in uh, as the market's been dropping is index funds, ETFs. Um, when it comes to individual stocks and companies, I'm waiting until they become even more discounted and more on sale uh, because there's just a lot more volatility, especially in the tech sector, which I'm quite heavily invested in Amazon and Apple and Google and you know company, companies like that. So for me, um, I've been more leaning towards investing in the Vanguard S&P 500, you know, uh, the, you know, the Vanguard High Dividend Yield ETF. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the Vanguard uh, total stock market and the Vanguard international stock market, like the VTI and VT are the tickers for that. So for those ones, that gives me more exposure just to the either the U.S. economy or the global economy or the tech sector, um, rather than taking on as much risk as involved in investing in one individual company. So for me, that's what I've been doing and will continue to do is build up my investments in my ETFs. Um, and then, uh, you know, if things continue to drop, then I plan to invest more into Apple and, you know, Amazon and, you know, Shopify and, you know, a lot of these companies that I've already invested in that I do like still long term. So that's kind of what I'm investing in and plan to con continue to invest in for the next uh, 12 months or so. And of course, you know, for me, I, you know, my, my portfolio has taken a big hit, you know, this year, as I'm sure many others have. Um, but I don't really get, too bothered by that because my investing strategy is for the long term. So, you know, I'm investing for 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, most of my investments are going to be for my retirement or going to, you know, get passed on to my kids one day or grandkids, et cetera. So uh, for me, I have that long-term horizon. So I actually have been waiting and prepared 
for recessions and circumstances like this, uh, because I think these are great opportunities to invest a lot and do really well long term. So I'm, I'm expecting things to still be shitty for the next year. Um, but I'm also expecting that two years from now, three, four, five years from now, things are going to be well beyond, you know, what it is today and, and eclipse, you know, where we were at the start of this year. Uh, Mr. Cross says, do you think, do you think KDP is still viable or already overcrowded? Thank you. Uh, well, M cross, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not really as active in, you know, as Amazon, as much as I used to, I'm not really like, uh, I don't have a good pulse on the market and the opportunity in general, but oftentimes the way that I answer questions like this is, um, generally, you know, the opportunity is still good. Yes. But it depends on the approach that you're taking. You know, um, if you're someone that says, you know what, I want to write a book. This is the topic that I want to write or create a book on. Uh, this is a topic that I think can do well. And I'm willing to promote my book. I'm willing to get out there if I need to. I mean, you know, some people that if you write your own book, maybe it's going on podcasts, maybe it's, you know, putting out what you want to share, then of course you can have success with that. If you have more of the approach of, well, I just want to, you know, create a bunch of books, throw them up there, and hopefully they do well, then you're probably not going to have that much success. And you'll probably say, oh, you know, it was overcrowded. I think the success of any opportunity primarily is dependent on you. You make your business successful. You make your book successful. You make your product successful. You make your YouTube channel successful. Whatever it is, it comes down to you. And I think oftentimes people, they want to perhaps blame the opportunity or the market or, you know, it's saturated, it's overcrowded. Oftentimes I kind of think that's more of an excuse because I think someone that has a mentality of success says, no, I'm going to make this successful. And you can make it successful if there's a market for what it is that you're sharing or created that is valuable to people. And then number two, if you're willing to market it and promote it and sell it. Um, so, you know, you have to cultivate some skills to be able to sell or to learn how to market online. Um, and that was kind of more the approach that I started teaching with my course, Mastering Book Publishing and Mastering Book Marketing. Those are two different courses I put together is teaching people that a book is only one part of one's business. A book most often is used as a way to generate leads to funnel people into a bigger business that you might have. And if you look at my business, let's say Project Life Mastery, it consists, at least at one point, not as much now, but it, in the past when I was really active in my business, it consisted of multiple pillars. I had books. Those books would get me some sales, but wouldn't really make me that much in comparison to everything else that I was doing. But the books would attract people from a platform like Amazon to now find out about my blog or my YouTube channel or to get on my mailing list. And then that gave me the opportunity to share with people some of my courses that might be relevant to them, or maybe some products that I'm going to affiliate for that can also be relevant for them to also, maybe if they're interested, excuse me, in my coaching, which is something that I offered at the time, uh, you know, I had products on Amazon, physical products. And so books were just one part of a business. And that's, that's kind of really what I teach in my courses now is teach people how to build a business rather than just selling a product because a product is not yet a business until you take into other factors into account. So I think, yes, it is still viable. People still buy on Amazon. Amazon is still big. There has been a dip since, um, you know, uh, you know, thing, since like the pandemic being over or whatever, you know, things going back to normal. So less people are buying online. People are going out there traveling more and being out and about. But yes, you know, I, I have friends that are writing books and launching books and selling them that are making a lot of money from it. And so, of course, you can too, but it ultimately comes down to your willingness and commitment and the strategy that you're implementing. Okay, Tony says, how did you find someone aligned with you while being deeply focused on your business, businesses? Uh, so, Tony, I, I guess, are you referring to relationships with Tatiana? Um if that's the case, you know, Tatiana and I have been together now for over eight years. And when I met her, you know, she was quite young. I was obviously a lot younger as well. I think one thing that was helpful is that we weren't already aligned with everything. Um, the main quality that I think 
we've both had Tatiana and I is that we've both been very open-minded. You know, when I met Tatiana, I shared with her, you know, personal development essentially and shared with her, you know, Hey, you can build a business on the internet. You can sell on Amazon. I just shared with her different possibilities and things that I was exposed to that I was on board with. And for her assessing the things that I was sharing with, with her, it just made sense for her to, of course, yeah. Why wouldn't I also be interested in personal development? Why also wouldn't I want to improve my life or build an, wow, I can build an online business. Sure. I'm going to go for that. So she's always been very open-minded to the things that I have shared with her and vice versa, things she shared with me. And I think that quality of open-mindedness, not being fixed and rigid on beliefs and certain positionalities, having that open-minded and that non-attachment towards thing has been a, a very important quality in our relationship because we're always, we're always committed to what is best and what is of highest truth. And uh, what, you know, if our life can be better, if I can be better, I'm more than willing to listen to the feedback because um, I want to improve and I want to grow and vice versa for her. So I think that is uh, what has allowed us to be aligned in many ways. And I see a lot of challenges when people come to me in relationships that are lacking alignment on that one simple principle, which is having an open mind. For example, people might come to me and say, oh, I'm really into personal development or I want to start an online business, but my husband or my wife, they don't support me. They're not into it. They don't want to make any changes in their life. They don't want to hear it. I try sharing things with them. They're not interested. You know, they think, you know, building an online business is never going to work, yada, yada, yada. And that's a very difficult position to be in because one person's open-minded and is, you know, eager and open to making changes in their life and wanting to create a better life, but the other person's not. They just want to stay where they are. They don't want to maybe embrace the courage that it takes to face their vulnerabilities, their flaws. They don't want to maybe see that something is insufficient in their life that they might need to change or address. Oftentimes they're in their ego and they can be very defensive. You know, if you bring up something to them and they'll just, you know, get defensive around that and, you know, not be willing to look at that or, you know, they just maybe have more of a pessimistic attitude on things and don't believe you know, and what's possible or whatnot. So that's a very challenging situation to be in. And I've always struggled giving people advice for that because, you know, it's hard. You can't change the person that you're with. You have to ultimately accept them and love them for who they are. And, uh, you know, you can live your life on your terms the way you want and hope that you inspire them enough to come around to it. But it's, it could, that, that's one of the most difficult situations to be in in a relationship, which is why I think it's so important to ensure that the partner that you do choose to spend your life with is someone that you do have alignment on what is most important to you. And that may or may not also be personal development and having this open mind. I think that if two people have an open mind and they're committed to personal development and being the best they can be, you can overcome any problem, any challenge that ar arises because the solutions and the answers are there. There's more than enough evidence of people that have turned their life around in multiple circumstances. And when you take on that mindset, then the sky's the limit. Everything is possible. All right, let's move on to some more questions here. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay, Christopher says, uh, will you have any more courses, programs, seminars in the future? Uh, your courses have helped me so much and I always go back to them when I need. Thanks, Stefan, you're for your great work and helping me. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, to be honest right now, Christopher, I don't have any plans for any new courses or programs or seminars. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this stream, uh, I've been taking more time away from business and, uh, you know, being an influencer and whatnot. Um, and just been, you know, more focused on other aspects of my life. I think there might be a time again in the future where perhaps I am passionate about, you know, maybe creating a course or sharing something a little bit more in depth uh, to potentially help people or to put on an event here and there. Uh, you know, doing like a, a one day event or something that's just, you know, a way to connect with my subscribers and, you know, maybe do like a mastermind or something. It's something that I've floated with. I haven't done any events since the uh, start of the pandemic. So that is something I might consider doing. Um, you know, I might put on something at my house here in Vancouver or maybe in Panama, invite people over if they want to come. 
and um, you know, just make it a positive event, event where we can support one another. But right now, there's no de uh, definite plans for anything like that. Um, a lot of you know, a lot of things that you know I learn are often from other people, of course. And you know, I come across a good course or program that I'm doing that I share with my audience. And in many circumstances, I prefer that. And I can be an affiliate for them, so I can kind of have a business relationship. But I can share programs that you know, the people that have created it are better at teaching it than I am. And that's exactly what I decided to do with the plan. Uh, Dan Hollings and his team is, you know, he created a strategy and discovered a way of making passive income with crypto. I was shared with it over a year ago. I got into it. I've enjoyed it. Uh, I've made some good money with it. I've also lost some money in crypto as well uh, with things crashing, but I've enjoyed learning that from him and his team. And I've never really wanted to teach that because there's honestly uh, still a lot of things about the whole crypto thing that I don't fully understand. I'm not an expert on it, but you know, I still want to share it with my audience because I think it can be valuable for people. So that's a circumstance where I'm like, hey, check out this course. Uh, I'm an affiliate for it. I think it can benefit you guys. If it is something that resonates with you, check it out. It's what I'm doing. And if not, that's okay too. So I've kind of taken that approach uh, sometimes as just being an affiliate for things because uh, it's a lot of work creating a course. Um, you know, for me, I've also had to have a lot of staff and people involved in the creation of a course and updating the course. And there's a level of responsibility that comes with creating courses also that I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know if I can make that commitment at this stage to really be on top of. So uh, we'll see. But currently there's there's no definite plans. And on the note of crypto, again, I threw that uh, link in the description for you guys if you're interested in learning more about the plan and the upcoming uh, webinar that I think is on Saturday, which there should be a replay for, by the way. If you guys can't make it, you can still register and um, join in on the replay. Okay. I know there's lots more questions coming in. Let me just scroll down to the bottom. So um I won't be able to answer everybody's questions, but uh, let me see what, what you know what's kind of new on people's minds. Uh, are you going to do some more drugs like ayahuasca? Uh, I have no plans for doing ayahuasca currently. Uh, I think ayahuasca is something that you have to be called to do. You have to feel the time is right to go through it because it can be uncomfortable. It can be very distressing to go through it, uh, mostly because psychedelics like ayahuasca, they, they bring to your conscious mind things that are suppressed in your unconscious mind. Uh, I did um, a psilocybin mushroom uh, journey about a month, two months ago. Uh, so I'll probably do some psilocybin again. Um, there's a really good docu-series on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind by, I think, Michael Pollan. Really good. I recommend it because each episode goes into different psychedelics. It goes into LSD. It goes into psilocybin, um, you know, MDMA. And... Um, I, I think that psychedelics for me personally, and, and kind of what I see right now in the world is I think it's a big, it's going to be a big part of the solution to the mental health challenges that exist. You know, right now I'm in Vancouver and man, it's gotten rough. It's got, you know, it's definitely changed um, since the pandemic, since before the pandemic, I'm seeing a lot more people that are homeless on the streets. I'm seeing people, you know, camping out in the parks and their tents. I'm seeing a lot more crime in the city. I'm seeing a lot more mental health issues, especially on the downtown east side. And the challenge and frustration that I've often had with this is what's the solution? You know, what's the solution to homelessness and and really mental health? Because I think that's one of the root causes that if you don't address that, then it's not really going to solve the addiction and the other issues that come with, you know, those that are in those circumstances. And I, you know, I'm not just seeing it you know, here and locally in the city that I'm in, but I'm seeing it all over the internet. You know, I'm seeing a lot of trauma and, you know, so many issues, so much suffering in the world that uh, it can be overwhelming for me to focus on at times. And I've had a lot of optimism when it comes to psychedelics, because there's been a lot more research and studies of it being used therapeutically. And, you know, for example, I was watching a TED talk there's a few TED talks that I've watched, but one of them, they were talking about people that have treatment resistant depression. This was a psychiatrist and them and a few other doctors were, you know, doing some studies with those that have treatment resistant depression. So antidepressants aren't working for them. They've been depressed for 10, 20, 30 years. 
and they'll do a psilocybin magic mushroom therapy with them. And in one session, and it's therapeutic in the sense, you know, they're, they're with someone in a safe environment. They have a blindfold on maybe, or they're listening to some music and someone's, you know, guiding them through the journey consciously. And in one session, it will cure their depression, like incredible things like that occurring, which, which nothing else has been able to accomplish in the er area of mental health. Uh, also, I was, you know, uh, learning about a study, studies they're doing where they're using psilocybin for people that are facing death. You know, people, let's say they have stage four cancer, they're going to die. And that's a very distressing thing to confront death. And by using psilocybin, it's allowed them to come at peace with that and have a different perspective because what psychedelics do is like things like addiction Things like, you know, these bad habits that we have or, you know, fixed belief systems. These are all kind of rigid and fixed positionalities that occur. And psychedelics, they shake all of that up. So it's kind of like a snow globe, right? You take a snow globe, you shake it up, and then everything resettles, you know, the snow settles again. It's the same thing that happens with our brain. Um, it kind of allows you to take like an addictive mind, let's say, or someone who's depressed, that's a very fixed, rigid way of being in one's mind and brain. And it allows them to come out of the experience with different insights, different perspectives, uh, to be at a different level of consciousness than they were before. And, you know, with something like death, it allows them oftentimes to have a spiritual experience, which is harder to articulate and describe, but there's spiritual experiences that one can have and experience that gives them a deeper meaning or purpose for their life or what they're going through, or maybe changes their perspective on death um, and allows them to release maybe their attachment to their physical body and to see that, you know, their life can go on and maybe there's a heaven or maybe there's, you know, life after death, whatever it is, but it gives them a higher, more conscious perspective most often, which can be very healing. So there's, there's a lot more that's become available, but I'd recommend that docu-series, How, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. As many more resources you could look into, but um, I'm I'm a fan of psychedelics. I think you know, obviously there are some risks, and you can overuse it, and you know all that sort of stuff. But I think used therapeutically, um, it's going to be a big part of the solution. And it's even something that I'm so passionate about that I want to donate. I'm trying to figure out the way to do this, but I'm I want to donate a significant amount of my net worth, especially when I pass on, to helping helping contribute to the mental health crisis that exists in the world, because that's something that, you know, affects everybody and, and everything on this planet. And it's something that I want to try to contribute to as much as I can in my lifetime. All right, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, William says, do you offer one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, or motivational counseling? Currently, I do not. I've always floated with maybe going back to doing some coaching here and there, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Currently, currently, I don't, and currently, I don't have any plans, but, uh, you know, might change. I might take on a client or two here and there. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. So skater, skater, hate 55, uh, Vancouver. Are you familiar with Dr. Gaber Mate? I'm actually looking into Ibogaine therapy for myself. Yeah. So I am familiar with Dr. Gaber Mate. He's, uh, someone that's located here in Vancouver. He does a lot of work on the downtown East side. He's kind of like a trauma expert and I, I highly recommend uh, checking him out on YouTube or checking out some of his books. There's a good, actually, I, I, recently watched an interview with Dr. Gaber Mate on Joe Rogan. So that's a, a good interview. And they talk about psychedelics and whatnot as well. But, um, you know, he believes that uh, the root of addiction is trauma. And, uh, you know, healing our trauma is an important part of healing our mental health. Oh, thank you very much, Jordan. Appreciate the kind words. 
Okay, uh, vamp vampire. How do you keep motivated to keep going when you don't see results when starting a new business and project? Yeah, great question. So I think first and foremost is that you can't be so attached to the results because if you're so attached to the results, then your motivation is going to be conditional based on either the results that you do get or the lack of results. What I've often recommended for people is to focus more on the process than the results. The results that you're after, let's say starting a new business, you don't have full control over. Okay, You don't have 100% control over the results. You can influence the results, but you can't guarantee the results. Often when you're starting a new business, you have a certain plan in your mind or a certain you know, plan that you're following or certain ideas. You have certain expectations even, which is dangerous because when you have these expectations, these attachments to things happening the way you want it to go, you're often setting yourself up for disappointment because most often in life, things don't happen the way you expect them to. There's going to be road bumps. There's going to be challenges, things unexpected. You're going to grow in the journey and be able to make different decisions or distinctions that you know maybe you have to pivot to go down this path or you have to pivot this way and go in this direction. You have to maintain that flexibility with the process and you also have to know that you're going into starting a new business naive. You don't know what it takes to build a business if you've never built one before. You don't know what success looks like and the process and the journey towards success if you've never walked down that path. So you're going into it naive. You're speculating. You're guessing. You know, you think, okay, it's going to take me six months and I'm going to see this result. Or it's going to, you know, a year from now, I'm going to quit my job and I'll be making all this money. No, you don't know that. Okay. So you have to go into it humble and knowing that you're going into it naive. And what you need to do is let go of the attachment to the result, have some goals. I want to make this amount of money. I want to get this many customers. I want to, you know, do this, have those result oriented goals, but more importantly, have process oriented goals, which are goals that you have control over and the, the goals that are the more important ones that actually lead to the results. So for example, if I was starting a YouTube channel, website, whatever it is, any business, let's say uh, what I would do is I could set a goal, let's say on a YouTube channel, I'm going to have 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year in the next 12 months. I, I don't really have control over that. I don't know how many subscribers I'm going to get, but what I can control is the process of, okay, I'm going to publish three videos a week for the next 12 months. You know, I know if I do that and I get better and better at that process and I stick to that, then that will lead to the subscribers. It will lead to the success. It will lead to that result. You know, if I'm trying to create a business, it's like, okay, one process goal is to create and launch my website. Okay, great. That's something I have control over that will lead to the result. Okay, I need to, uh, I'm going to publish uh, two blog posts per week on my blog. You know, okay, I'm going to uh, set up this Facebook advertising campaign and I'm going to get my ad spend down to this much, you know, this much, my conversions at this or that. That's a process goal that you have control over that you can do. So that's what I would try to focus on is what, what is the process that you need to get better and better at, that you need to learn, that you need to apply and let go of the result. The results will come once you've got down and you've mastered that process. And then the other thing also is that you have to have a strong enough why and purpose for what you're doing. Your why has to, it has to overpower your limitations, your excuses, your fears, your anxieties, whatever it might be. I've, always share this example is that let's say that you have a, a goal that you're trying to pursue, you know, something that you want right now in your life. Maybe it's, you know, making a million dollars or something like that. You know, here on this end of the spectrum, let's say, let's say that, you know, you're pursuing this goal, but you have some fear, you have some insecurities, you have resistance that's coming up, that's preventing you from taking action. And let's say that, on a scale from zero to 10 is a, like a level six or a level seven. The way to overcome that is to have on this end of the spectrum, have a why, a purpose, something that's so important, a reason why you want the success, the goal so bad that on a scale from zero to 10, this one is a seven, eight, nine, or 10. If you, if you want something so bad, then that will overpower whatever your insecurities, fears, doubts, excuses are. It will just always overpower it. And that's been my, you know, my experience is I've had fears and doubts and worries about putting up, you know, being on YouTube or 
you know, I've, I've had them just like everybody else, but I've wanted it bad enough. You know, for, like if someone puts a gun to your head, it doesn't matter what the fear or the excuse is, you're going to do it because there's a consequence for not doing it. You know, so it's taking on that mentality and finding what is that reason? What's that purpose? Why is this important to you? And making sure that that is driving you beyond whatever the limitations might be. Um, that's what it takes to be successful because, and that's really what it comes down to. You know, if you look at someone who is successful and someone that isn't, the person that is, you know, wasn't smarter than everyone else. Uh, you know, maybe they didn't have more resources than anyone else. They just wanted it more. They just wanted it badly enough. They're willing to grind. They're willing to hustle. They're willing to suffer. They're willing to make sacrifices. They're willing to fail and, you know, fall down and get back up and sweep themselves off and refocus on what they want. And they're willing to look at their flaws and weaknesses and their vulnerabilities and address that and make changes in themselves. They're willing to do that because they wanted it bad enough to, 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 to now this idea of having that why and wanting it bad enough is something that you need to dig deep inside to find, but also in some cases manufacture within yourself. So for me, when I, um, started pursuing success, I had many different whys. I had many different reasons for that. Some of them were pain. You know, I looked at my childhood and the pain of not having money growing up financially, you know, with my, my family financially and my, the pain of my parents going through a bankruptcy, my, the pain of my parents fighting all the time over a lack of money, the pain of being a kid and wanting this for Christmas, but my parents couldn't afford it. The pain of seeing other kids, you know, their parents buying them, you know, these cool gifts and experiences. And I wasn't able to do that. The pain of, you know, just the pain of having a lack of finances. That was something that I went through that was a big part of my why and my purpose for becoming successful, because I didn't want to go through that in my future. And I didn't want my kids that when I do have kids, I don't want them to go through what I went through. I want them to have opportunities that I didn't have. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I couldn't play hockey. Hockey is an expensive sport. You need to buy all the equipment. You need to, you know, you grow out of the equipment after a year or two, you have to buy more equipment. It's an expensive sport that I couldn't play because my parents didn't have the financial means that when I have kids in the future, if they want to play hockey, I want to provide that opportunity for them. So that was part of my why and my purpose. Part of my purpose also was, you know, immature, egotistical things. Like I want to prove that person wrong, you know, or I want to prove to myself, or I want to, you know, show people what I can do. You know, that's nonetheless something that did motivate me. So I did have a useful purpose to it. Um, and then even some reasons why for me, honestly, were me convincing myself of the illusion that success was going to like solve everything in my life or make me happy or create this perfect life. And that's not true. <laughs> you know, uh, having success or money doesn't guarantee your happiness by any means. Um, but I convinced myself of that. All right. And because I convinced myself of that, I pursued it relentlessly, uh, believing that it was going to give me, uh, more than what I expected. You know, I, I exaggerated even to myself, uh, all the good and the benefits and all that, that would come from something like success. So those are some examples, but you've got to dig deep. You've got to find what those are, man. And you've got to, you know, you've really got to up the ante on your, yourself and, and, and make sure you're committed to following through if you do want to achieve what you want to achieve in life. Um, so that, that'd be my advice on that. All right, let's dive to some more questions. Great questions, guys. We've been going for almost an hour. Uh, we'll keep going for another 30 or 60 minutes or so. Okay, Victor says, best online business to start with. Okay, so Victor, the best uh, advice that I give to anybody that's asking this question is the best online business to start with is the online business that you believe in number one, and that number two, you're actually going to follow through on. Because whenever people ask, what's the best online business? It's really subjective because for everyone, it's different. I don't know your background. I don't know your skills. I don't know your level of intelligence. I don't know your work ethic. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know how much time you have to dedicate to building a business. There's many things that play a role in determining one's success in any business. And regardless of the business model, there's people that I could point to that are successful. 
with those business models. So if it's selling a physical product on Amazon, there's people that do that and they're very successful. If it's drop shipping, there's people that do that. They're very successful. If it's publishing books, there's people that do that and they're very successful. If it's a YouTube channel, there's people that do that and they're very successful. It doesn't matter what it is. Like there's people that are successful in all of these, but the best one is, is something that there's no general answer to this because it's dependent on the individual. You know, so for example, what, what skills do you have, Victor? Where, you know, where are you coming from? Do you have, are you, are you, a, you know, a good speaker? Are you a good communicator? Okay. Maybe for you, the best business model could be like a YouTube channel or a podcast, you know, or maybe you're more like the behind the scenes kind of guy. You don't want to put yourself out there and that's not really your style. So, you know, maybe for you, maybe it's, you know, writing a book or maybe it's um, launching a physical product on Amazon or it's drop shipping, or maybe it's cryptocurrency investing, something like that. And, and maybe you're more of an analytical mind, you know, more left brain, and you like to look at numbers and data and you're good at interpreting that and making decisions based off that. So there are certain businesses that might be more suitable for you in that circumstance. You know, maybe you like writing and you're a good writer. Okay. Well, maybe writing, a, you know, creating a blog, you know, or writing books, is a good path for you. Um, you know, so, you know, maybe you have a good amount of money to invest. If you have 10,000 plus that ob obviously opens up a lot more doors, a lot more opportunities versus if you're strapped for cash, you don't have much, you're a lot more limited. You know, you have to find, you know, maybe you have to start creating content, which doesn't really cost any money, but you start doing that. You got to build your way up and get organic traffic and subscribers and, you know, grind your way that way until you make some money from it. So, it really depends on the individual. There is no best online business. Uh, it's all relative to the individual and where they are and starting from. But that's why ultimately, you know, I say to people, it's what you believe in and what you're actually going to do. Because I could say to you, wow, this is the best business opportunity. Or someone else on a YouTube ad could say, this is the best business opportunity. That doesn't mean anything unless you believe it and that you're going to actually do it. There's plenty of people that, oh, wow, I, I should start doing this. But they don't really believe they can do it. They don't, have, they don't believe that the success is possible. They don't have the motivation and they don't do anything with it. It's not the business model. It's just them and how, you know, it just did, it didn't resonate with them. So what I'd recommend anyone to do is just look at the different opportunities. There's many of them out there. Find a few people that are successful at those opportunities, learn a little bit about it, and then determine which one do you resonate the most with. Some of them, yes, you can make more money with than others. Some of them might be easier than others or harder than others. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. What really matters is the one that you actually believe in and the one that you're going to do. That's it. You know, I, there's people that will be successful in any business model, anything they put their mind to if they are committed to it. All right. Here's an interesting question. <clears throat> if you could tell your former self one thing right now, what would it be? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. I'd, I'd probably say to my former self, you are enough. You are enough. You're enough the way you are. You're enough um, you, you have enough, you've achieved enough, you're good enough that you're just enough. I think that a lot of people go through life feeling like they're not enough and they have this void that they're trying to fulfill and they're trying to fill that, including myself from things on the outside. You know, they're, they're, they, they give their source of happiness to the external world. You know, they think that having more money is going to make them feel enough. They think that having a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend is going to make them feel like they're enough. They feel like if I have this car, then I'll feel like I'm enough. If I have all these people that like me and love me, or I'll feel like I'm enough. And that's an illusion. And the reality is, is that the source of happiness is inside and that you are ready are enough. And if you look at it from the perspective or the level of consciousness of, let's say, God or whatever the higher power is that you might believe in, you are made perfect. You're complete. There is nothing to pursue. There's nothing to achieve. You are enough the way that you are. Now, if you want to achieve and create and um, 
you know, use your creativity and the gifts that you've been given, you can do that. But that th anything on the outside, anything you do or achieve, which is nothing wrong with, that is not the source of your worth. You know, your worth is unlimited. It's not limited in any way. It's, um, so th I guess that's what I would probably tell myself is that to recognize that you're just enough the way you are. And yes, still, you know, pursue goals and you know, have fun in life and experience things and push your limits and challenge yourself and do all those things. But, you know, don't buy into the illusion that um, anything outside of yourself is going to be the source of your happiness. And to, um, you know, put put God first, put, um, you know, a higher power first in your life that provides for you the humil humility in life. And, um, you know, I believe in my experience has been by putting my faith in God, you know, life is just so much easier. You know, I'm not trying to control life as much and have things go the way I want it to be. I'm trusting in God to guide me. And God, I believe, has always guided me throughout my life and is guiding everybody here as well. So uh, it'd probably be some sort of deeper spiritual thing like that that I would have probably told myself. Um, so that that at least be one thing that I'd tell my former self. I'd probably also tell my former self that everything's going to be okay. You know, sometimes, um, you know, People that are here right now, no matter what you're going through, sometimes it feels like it's permanent and it's not. You know, everything we're going through right now, if it's challenging, difficult, it's all transitory. It's all impermanent. It comes and it goes. There's, you know, better days ahead. And you have to have that faith that, you know, whatever your suffering is that you're going through, it will serve a higher purpose in your life. I remember, you know, times in my life when I was going through depression, mental health challenges, addictions whatever it was. And it feels like, you know, why is this happening to me? Or why do I have to go through this? And it feels like this handicap or this burden that you might have that you're going through. But what I've come to recognize through that is those were gifts in my life that sometimes you can't see it in the moment, but when you get a higher perspective and as time passes, you look back and you're like, wow, you know, it's because I went through that, you know, and I hit rock bottom that I discovered this, or I made this change in my life, or, you know, because of that pain that I went through, I addressed this in my life. And, you know, I can, I can look at the good that has come from all of that, which I'm grateful for, because if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't have had those insights and those realizations and these understandings and this new way of being that is now a great benefit today. Um, so that is also something that I would tell myself and share with anybody here is whatever you're going through right now, have faith and trust that there's a gift in it. There's a gift in it. And for you got to find what that is. But man, if you're going through depression, that's challenging to go through. But I have faith that someone who is going through depression or anxiety or addiction or failures or whatever it is, whatever challenges are going through that I hold for everybody on this planet, a, a bright and positive vision of what can be for them their potentiality. And I believe that in everyone that things can be better and will be better as long as you hold that belief system in your mind. And if things will be better, then you're going to be better off for what you've gone through. Like if you go through depression, you know, even though that sucks to go through, I can, you know, someone who goes through depression and they come out of it on the other side and they find joy and happiness, that person's going to have a powerful mindset you know, they're going to have certain realizations and habits, and they're going to be at a level of consciousness that they wouldn't have been able to achieve if it wasn't for that, you know, or someone who's getting bullied, you know, sucks to go through that. But that person who goes through being bullied is going to have a level of compassion for others now because they know what it's like. They're going to be able to help others and give quality advice to people that are going through being bullied. They can now be a leader or a mentor to younger kids because they've been through it and they overcame it. You know what I mean? So, I always try to take that optimistic, positive attitude and look for the gift and uh, having that as a good reminder for ourselves and our past and, and our current circumstances, I think is always important. Always maintain that vision of what can be in your life and it will be. All right. Let's see what other questions we've got coming in here.
Uh, okay. Makish says, Hey dude, what's your thoughts on Dr. Jordan Peterson? You know, I, I like uh, Jordan Peterson quite a bit. Um, I like his, uh, I like the way he thinks about things. He's incredibly intelligent. He thinks about things on a, you know, pretty high level. Uh, I don't agree with everything that he says. Um, but I do enjoy listening to him. He's, uh, I've read his first book or not his first book, uh, 12 rules for life. His second book, I've read that I enjoyed it. Um, but I tend to agree with a lot of things that he shares and he makes me think a lot, which I appreciate. And he's, he's taught me some valuable things in my life that I'm grateful for. Um, I don't get as much caught up in all the, the politics and the drama, <laughs> you know, that unfortunately he's had to endure. Um, you know, one thing that I, I wish for a Jordan Peterson, um, cause I do, I do love him and I, I think he's a great human being in many ways is I just wish that he was more joyous in his life. He was more happy in his life. And I, I, I have my opinion on why there is levels of suffering. I I've noticed and observed within him. There's some levels of anger, some suppressed, uh, emotions and perhaps even traumas that, I don't think he's addressed and I'd be curious to know his perspective on some aspects of that. But, um, I, I think that if he was a joyous, happy person, he would have a lot more influence and, uh, even more influence in my life. Because for me, I'm, uh, I, I like to, to learn from people and follow people and, and at least look up to people that have what I desire on some level. And I, I, you know, there, there's many reasons why perhaps, um, you know, he doesn't come across the most joyous or happy. I don't know his personal life and all of that, but I think if that was something that, um, he was able to come from a more joyous and happier place, um, which I wish for everybody, you know, I want everybody to be happy at the end of the day. Um, uh, but yeah, I think he'd be more effective and have a greater influence. Uh, okay. Caroline says, would you consider a YouTube channel that averages 30 K a video of failure, or do you believe they should keep going? So the average is 30 K like 30,000 views per video. Uh, would I say that's a failure? Uh, of course not. Um, you know, if you're getting 30,000 views a video, you're doing incredibly well. So I'm not sure if I misunderstand your question. Um, but you know, ultimately how, how you define success or failure is subjective. Everybody defines it differently. So, you know, you have to determine what you want out of a YouTube channel. You know, what do you want to accomplish with it? What are your goals with it? You know, are you creating a YouTube channel to get a certain, uh, number of views, subscribers, success, make money? Are you doing it because of more, you know, personal passion and something that you would enjoy? that, uh, you know, Hey, if you got a small community of a couple hundred people watching your videos, maybe that's, that's great. And that's a great success. I mean, I tend to think that anytime you're positively influencing anybody, I think that's, that's a good thing. And that's a, a good service to the world. There's no greater purpose in life than of being of service to others. I think sometimes what gets in the way is people, they compare themselves to others. They see other people getting all this views or all the success and they're not, and they feel even though, you know, what they're doing can be great and making an impact, they don't feel like they are, or that is good enough because they're too caught up in comparing themselves to someone else instead of appreciating and celebrating the reach and the impact that they are making. So, uh, you have to be careful not to fall into that trap of comparison. Uh, coach Kenneth says, how did you know this was your path? I didn't, and I still don't know. I don't think that you need to know uh, what is your path because who the hell knows what their path is? I mean, the, the nature of a human being on this planet is one of humility because nobody really knows the absolute truth. Nobody really knows what their destiny is. Nobody really knows what happens when they die. Nobody really knows a lot of things. So we're all by nature humbled by our existence here on life. And the same thing goes with what is our path. Um, for me, I never needed to know what the path is because I've always believed that the journey of life is always evolving. You know, I have something that maybe excites me or I'm passionate about or something that I want to pursue. I do it, but 
as you do it and as you go down that path, you grow in many different ways and you evolve. And then maybe you determine, hey, this path isn't what I thought it was, or it's not leading me where I want to go. Now there's this new chapter of my life that I want to go down and I want to go down this path. You know, and then you go down that path, and then maybe that path changes and evolves into a different path. And so um if you wait till having to know or define exactly what the path is or what your purpose is, then you're you're always gonna, you know, be lost, in my opinion, instead of just, you know, trusting that you're guided down this path and that can lead to something else. You know, so it's hard to even project what your life will look like beyond 10, 10 years. You know, your life can change so much in 10 years. You can become a totally different person. You could take on different interests, different goals, different a different vision for your life. You know, even for me, for example, uh, you know, I know when I was going down the path of, let's say, success, um, as I was pursuing that path and and even kind of, you know, having fun with the material world, you know, it took me kind of having some of that to realize, ah, you know, I don't really care that much about materialism. I don't really care that much about having designer clothes and you know, I had to go through that a bit to realize it. So sometimes, um, you know, I, I think you just trust on the path that you're going down, but you always remain open and flexible to something better coming into your life. Uh, okay. Uh, Jordan from Canada, Stefan, what do you think you and Tatiana learned during the early stages of the pandemic? Hmm. Great question. Well, you know, believe it or not, <laughs> this might sound bad, I guess, but, uh, you know, we weren't too affected by the pandemic. And I think obviously that might be because, you know, we already had online businesses, um, you know, we're already in a good financial position. Uh, we're already, you know, quite introverted, both Tatiana and I. So, you know, our kind of preference is to oftentimes, you know, be, be at home, you know, with each other. And, you know, we didn't really... Uh, we can go a long period of time without, you know, having to socialize with people and things like that. So uh, it didn't really affect, if, uh, affect, if, uh, affect us as much as perhaps other, peop other people. Um, we just kind of used it as an opportunity. We just saw, okay, this is what's happening right now. We don't have control over this. Uh, we were in Panama at the time and they uh, imposed some strict lockdowns. Panama's lockdowns were that men and women can only go out certain days of the week. And you can only go out for a two hour window uh, based on the last digit of your ID. So if your last digit of our ID is like six, you could only go out from like six to eight, either in the morning or the evening time. And nothing was open. Like the only things were open that you could go to would be the grocery store and the pharmacy. So um, they had pretty strict lockdowns, but you know, for us, we're like, you know, what can we do and what can we control? And for us, we invested a good amount when the market crashed in 2020. So that paid off for us. And that was a, a good thing that came, a good opportunity that came. And then also what happened was our businesses grew, our online businesses grew because everybody was in lockdown and spending more time on the internet. Um, you know, to give you an idea, my YouTube channel at that time for several months after that was getting like 1.3 million views a month. You know, and before that, I was averaging like a million views a month. So it just blew up and continue to grow from that. Uh, Tatiana's business grew as well. You know, her um, Amazon and Shopify business was doing like 400,000 a month in sales. So, you know, we just doubled down on that. Okay, you know, there's not much we can do. We're gonna focus on our business. Uh, we focus a lot on our relationship as well. So we are able to spend a good amount of time learning about relationships and applying different things. Um, I spent more time in meditation and working on my habits, spent a lot of time learning, you know, listen to podcasts and interviews and reading books and doing all of that. And so we, you know, we always had faith and belief that things are going to come back to normal at some point, but we wanted just to make sure that we're going to be better for the experience rather than worse for it than that for it. So, um, I think that's what you learn is just, you can't control what's going on in the world, but what you can control is what you do and your mindset and your attitude. And we just chose to take on a good attitude during that time. One that would at least be helpful for us. Okay. 
Okay, life improvement projects, how to manage dating as an entrepreneur without getting carried away and losing focus on the business. Yeah, you know, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, there's no reason why you can't still have a great dating life and also grow your business. I think you have to define what your main priority is going to be, um, you know, and put, make sure that that is the, the main focus for you. If maybe it's your business, I, I, I kind of, you know, I remember for me, um, before I got into pursuing success and whatnot, I was really focused on my personal life, my dating life and my relationships. So I got into like the whole pickup seduction industry when I was 17 years old. And, uh, at that time in my life, I had a lot of insecurities. I had a lot of things I wanted to change and I wanted to be more confident, more social and have relationships with women. So I made that my primary focus. That was my life. I was going out several days a week. I was going to nightclubs. I was going through programs to improve my social skills, my confidence, my dating life. But what happened was after doing that for a few years, I felt like I kind of maxed out on the success that I was getting. I wasn't really getting that much further in my dating life and I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. And so I actually realized that I needed to take a step back from going out all the time and dating and all this because I knew that you know, it's just going to lead to more of the same. I wanted to make different changes in myself and my lifestyle and then go back to the dating world. So what I did was I decided, you know what, I'm going to take some steps away from going out and dating and I'm going to focus on my life. I'm going to create an amazing life. And that's when I started getting into fitness. I did fitness competition. I started building a business and making some money and creating some success. You know, I, 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 I moved into a good apartment. I, I made you know, I became more knowledgeable, more interesting, took up some new hobbies and interests and I worked on myself. And then when I put myself back into the dating world, I just got way better results because I had upgraded myself, I guess. And, um, you know, I got better reactions from the women that I wanted to date. So sometimes you have to do that, but I, I think by, uh, building a great life and maybe that is part of your business, having the freedom, being someone who's a leader, confident, successful, that will definitely impact your dating life and make things better for you. I think in terms of how to manage it, I think just having a schedule, you know, having the days of the week where you focus on your business and then having, you know, a day or two of the week where you focus on your dating life, you know, maybe you work on your business from Monday to Friday and then Saturday, you know, Friday night, you go on a date, maybe Saturday night, you go with your friends, you know, just try to define, you know, and schedule in how you want it to be so that you can make progress in both, both areas of your life. Uh, okay. Caroline says, I need advice. I feel like I don't have any passion and feel empty, uh, talentless when thinking about what, what business I could start. Well, Caroline, I think you don't need to overthink it too much. Pick a business and start. Move forward with it. Things uh, in terms of what your passion is and what you're good at, what you're, what you're not good at, your strengths, your weaknesses, all of that will come. All of that will come. You don't need to have all of those things in place before you get started. You should make this part of your journey right now a place of just maybe being in limbo and allow yourself just to discover. Discover yourself, discover different opportunities, learn some different skills, try different things, and see what resonates with you. See what you know you could enjoy doing and seeing what could lead to some success for you. I think oftentimes people feel like they need passion or they need to have talent to be successful or do something, and it's not true. Sometimes those things come as you go down the journey. And that's what the journey is about. The journey is an opportunity for you to discover these things, right? But if you're waiting for all your ducks to be lined up before you start, you're not going to do it. So, you know, maybe Caroline, just, you know, look at the, narrow down your options to five opportunities. Maybe, maybe you find a course or a program that can teach you and guide you through the process, but narrow it down to five and then narrow it down to three and then flip a coin, you know, pick something. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just pick something, do it for three months, regardless of whatever results you achieve. If you make no money, you have no success, it doesn't matter because the process of sticking with something for three months and what you learn and how you grow from that is going to be the success. That's, that's the success because now you're in a place of experience and knowledge after doing something for three months 
And then at that pl place, now you can reevaluate and say, ah, you know, this is not really for me. I'm going to pursue this opportunity instead. And you go down that path for three months and maybe you also determine, Hey, it's not for me. I'm going to go down this path instead. You go down that path and you're like, Oh wow, this path I actually enjoy. And what happens is now, as you've gained more experience, you become better at making decisions, right? Cause you're making decisions from a more experienced, a more informed place, a better position. So pick something. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, and, and don't expect the thing that you pick to be the end all be all the thing that you're going to do for the rest of your life. Cause it doesn't always work that way. Uh, for me, there's many things that I've tried along my journey. You know, I've done, you know, like for me, like the things that I could tell you guys, all the businesses that I've had since I started is too many to count. You know, I've done affiliate marketing, I've done blogging, I've done podcasts, YouTube coaching events, I've done uh, physical products, I've done drop shipping, I've done, you know, my own online courses, I've done, you know, a lot of different things. I've published books, all these, not all of them are my passion, and I didn't need them to be my passion, and I didn't even have any talent originally to do any of these things. I just started, pursued it for a bit, had some success or not success, whatever, but I, I learned from it and gained experience and that helped me for the next opportunity. Right now for me in my life, I'm in a different chapter where, hey, I'm looking for the next passion or the next thing that might excite me. I don't need to force it. I don't need to try to manufacture it in, in some cases. I can just trust that it will come. That right now I'm just going to a, a time, let's say, of reflection and growth and all that. And then that time will come. Reminds me of the hero's journey, you know, Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. If you're familiar with the hero's journey, it's like a circle. And the way that the hero starts out is uh, there's a call to an adventure. Okay. So the hero is kind of in this place of limbo. And there's a call to adventure that happens, some sort of opportunity or something happens. You know, there's some sort of call to adventure that often the hero is reluctant to pursue at first. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you can look at stories throughout history. If you look at, you know, even fictional stories like Star Wars, you know, Luke Skywalker had his family killed and there's a call to an adventure, but he is reluctant to take that on. But inevitably the hero often takes on that call to an adventure and they go through the journey, the hero's journey where they don't have any experience and they're insecure and you know they have to gain the skills and they find a mentor and that mentor teaches them things or they get this weapon and they have to slay the dragon and they have to go to the you know the abyss and the downside and all that until they eventually complete the circle and they become victorious and then they're in limbo again waiting for the next call to adventure and that that cycle never ends you know that's part of the hero's journey that um I think we can all relate to throughout our lives. Let me uh, let Kobe, Kobe, relax. I think Tatiana's filming in the other room. So Kobe is, let me introduce you guys to Kobe. I think you guys saw him when he was a puppy. Kobe, come here. Oh, there we go. Kobe, you wanna say hi to the camera? Hey, bud. Okay. You bored? He's a good boy. <laughs> okay, relax. It's okay. It's okay, buddy. He always needs to have some attention in order to be pet. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so Caroline, it will come. You know, you'll find it. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to have it all figured out. You know, that's one advice I give to young people. You know, if you graduate high school and you feel this pressure from your family or the other kids that, you know, all of, you know, it seems like they have it figured out. They're going to university and they have, you know, their, their future planned out for them. You know, most people are not like that and that's okay. Like you don't have to have everything figured out in life. You're never going to have everything figured out. Just, you know, allow yourself to, to, to read and, and reflect and journal and maybe travel and just, you know, you, you know, that passion and that, um, vision will start to manifest as time goes on. Um, all right. Clarinet off limits says totally agree with you. Stefan truth is when you stay focused and generate proper cash flow, you get a lot of attention from women, even considerably younger, uh, than you, as long as you have deep, po deep pockets, um, that might be true for a certain type of women that value money a lot and, you know, are pursuing men for that purpose. 
Uh, what I would say is what makes you attractive, especially the, as a masculine man, is more so a man on purpose. You know, when you're on purpose in your life and you have things that you're pursuing, you're making things happen, you're taking care of your body and working out and, you know, you're living your life purpose, purposeful, that is something that makes you attractive. Um, even more than things like money and, uh, you know, looks and aesthetics, ultimately what that can do is end up attract, because one of the challenges I think with having money or, uh, whatever it is, anything that's art of, you know, um, materialistic, I guess, is that it can actually allow you to attract the wrong people. You know, you don't want to attract people that are superficial. You don't want to attract people that are, um, you know, so in their ego, um, that they're, you know, focused and have attachments to materialistic things because you want someone that ultimately is, you know, attracted to you for you and who you are and your personality and your values and your beliefs and your, your integrity that you are as, as a person. So those are the, those, those are the qualities that are more sustainable and will actually lead you more to what it is that you want. Now, I think there is a, a biological evolutionary dynamic that exists on a survival level amongst, let's say men and women where, um, you know, women are traditionally attracted to men that can be providers that can ensure their safety, protect them and, um, ensure their security. You know, that's something that is ingrained, I think in the DNA that we've inherited through the collective consciousness over many, you know, thousands and thousands of years. So I think, there are certain characteristics that women can be attracted to of men of, let's say, high status, men of, you know, confidence, men of purpose, men that are leaders, you know, leaders, because that will ensure the survival of their offspring and vice versa. I think it's been imprinted in, in, uh, the masculine or in men of, you know, being attracted to women that have good genetics physically, because that will also ensure the survival of their offspring. So I think there's elements of that. But I think ultimately the goal is to attract someone beyond the ego, the egoic survival instincts and mechanisms and to attract someone who's more conscious than that. You know, we, I'm a big fan of David Hawkins and his map of consciousness. And for me, that's one of the ways that I look at human beings is I can, you know, I try to discern when people are in their ego versus those that are of a higher consciousness. And for me, I want to attract people that are of higher consciousness in my life. So that's maybe a bit of a deeper conversation, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Brett says, um, Brett Anderson says at your level of success, do you find it difficult to make genuine friends? Uh, not yes and no. Um, for me, I don't talk about success with people like, you know, people that I meet, they wouldn't know that I'm successful really. Um, and I, I prefer to keep it that way. You know, it's, I, I think, you know, for me also, I think as I've become more successful in my life and, and been successful for a longer period of time, I, I tend to like, not even think it is that important, you know, as much as I used to think it. So I don't view myself as better than anyone or that it's like an important thing. And in fact, in some cases it can be uncomfortable to have people know that let's say you're successful or whatever it is, because then they can perceive you a little bit differently. So for me, um, when it comes to friends and people that I meet, I just want to connect with them on a, a personal level. I want to get to know them. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a listener when I meet people and talk to them. Uh, I like to just listen and I'm generally a bit more quiet. And um, yeah, I just, I like to allow people to talk and share and I take a curiosity into people and I try to just connect with them on, yeah, on just simple human elements, I guess. And, uh, I don't want, I, I often can get turned off from people that, you know, I can kind of tell or be aware that they're just, you know, a bit in their ego or, you know, success and things like that are important to them, like really important to them. And they start asking me questions about things like that. I just, you know, it's one of the reasons I think also I value my friends that I've had for, you know, over 10 plus years, because they don't view me as, uh, you know, Stephen James or anything like that. They just see me as a human being and just, you know, the same friend that they've had for years. Um, so I guess in some ways, yes, it depends on the type of people, but I think in some ways it does you a favor too, because if you have awareness of certain people that just want to be your friend, cause you're successful, 
then uh, that is kind of in a way doing you a favor to weed out those people. And then uh, the, the, the friends or the people that don't care about that stuff, uh, those are the ones that, um, you know, that you can tell that you, you know, can make good friends. I, I also tend to like a lot of my friends, they're more into personal development and spirituality, I'd say. Um, and I think people that are into those topics, at least spirituality, they're not as, they don't care as much about success, I guess. And, um, yeah. Hey buddy. I know, I know you're bored. Kobe's got his head on my lap. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's do some more questions, guys. We'll stick around for another 30 minutes or so. So throw in any questions, anything you need help with, challenges, goals. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'll answer every question here. I think there's some that might not be as relevant for everybody, but I'll try to still pick you know a few that I think are, are good and I have maybe a good answer for. Some of them I might not have uh, as great of an answer for, so I might just skip it over. But throw it in here, guys, and I'll see what I can do to share any insights or things that could be useful for you guys. Uh, all right, Ruben says, how have your meditations evolved over time? Uh, i.e. types and length. What's your go-to meditations or spiritual metaphysical practices? Yeah, so Ruben, for me, meditation's always been a struggle. It's been something that I've had a lot of resistance to do in my life, even though I've heard about it, known the benefits of it, et cetera. And um, I, you know, for me, I think I've just had a very overactive mind and a very well-developed ego, you know, especially at uh, over the years of trying to create success and whatnot, I really developed my ego, which can make it uh, a bit more challenging to, in some cases, to make changes because, you know, now you have to let go of the ego and dissolve parts of it. And so um, I had a lot of attachments and fears and certain things that were getting in the way and causing a lot of resistance for me uh, to do my meditation. So for me, it's been a slow and gradual journey. For me, it was primarily just doing 10 minutes a day, you know, using guided meditations like the Calm app uh, and other, you know, ways of having a guided meditation. It was infrequent. It was, um, you know, I kind of had phases where I do like a challenge for 30 days and then I, you know, go off track for a few months and, you know, there's that back and forth effect that happens. But I never really expected myself or put pressure on myself that I have to be, you know, an hour a day type of meditator. I just knew that there'll be a journey that I'm going through. And as time goes on, I'll go deeper and deeper in my practice. Um, and then I started, uh, I've always been very interested in all different forms of philosophy, traditions, religions. Um, and so I started studying, uh, I, I started studying happiness and fulfillment a lot more that led me to studying enlightenment and, you know, there's the Buddhist idea of enlightenment or, you know, the Hindu idea of enlightenment. And so I was very curious. I'm like, hmm, interesting. That's a interesting experience that, you know, some people throughout history seem to have been able to experience. And um, so I, I took I took an interest in that and just having an open mind, you know, to explore uh, this idea of fulfillment and happiness and enlightenment. And it's kind of a difficult subject because it's not measurable like success is. You know, you can measure how much money in your bank account or how much sales your business gets or whatever it is. And topics like happiness and fulfillment is not a measurable topic. So uh, a lot of evidence came to meditation and the practice of it. And I started to learn more about how meditation can allow you to experience this egoless state where you've dissolved the personal self. You you, you no longer even feel identified with your own physical body and you achieve these higher states of consciousness where you just feel total peace. You experience this level of awareness that can just witness and observe thoughts, emotions, whatever arises. And you can experience, um, let's say your, your highest self, I guess, without the illusion of the ego and everything else. And so I started to experience that as I started meditating more. And that gave me a different purpose for meditation. Um, I, I think originally for me, meditation was a way just to, you know, calm my mind, feel less stress, less anxiety, maybe be a little bit more focused or something like that. And those are kind of the, the benefits that are advertised. But um, then I started to experience some of the spiritual benefits, I'd say, that have been promoted and talked about for thousands of years. So for me, um, 
yeah, that's kind of how it's expanded. I, I really enjoyed, um, what's that guy's name? He wrote a book called Meditation for Beginners. Jack Cornfield, I want to say. He's a, he's a good person to learn from. Uh, I enjoyed learning from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, he was a Zen Buddhist monk who unfortunately passed away, um, I think a number of years ago, but, uh, he, he's got some, some good stuff on YouTube with mindfulness and meditation. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, for me in terms of where I am now, um, you know, I meditate almost every day. I usually do it in the sauna. I've got an infrared sauna that we put it in our bathroom, which is cool. <laughs> and so I enjoy doing it in that, um, and it can range from 10 minutes to an hour, you know? Um, but it, for me, I, I, I still want to go deeper with my meditation. I'd like to do some meditation retreats and without a doubt, I've experienced some incredible benefits from it. It's just taken some time to go down that journey and to, you know, bring that awareness to it. There was times where I was actually meditating twice a day for over an hour. And yeah, you, you really get some amazing benefits when you do it like that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Eric says, how many times have you done neurofeedback training and are you going back to do more of that at BioCybernaut? Yeah, Eric, I've done quite a bit. Uh, so first here in Vancouver, I used to go to this place called the Swingle Clinic. Um, and uh, they do these neurofeedback sessions that are kind of short sessions. They're like 30 minutes uh, or 45 minutes or so. And um, I found that a bit useful, but didn't really give me the benefits that I was really looking for. Um, so I did that. I've done that dozens of times, I think, but yeah, the bio cybernaut was the ultimate, uh, with Dr. James Hart, you know, he's, I think the, you know, one of the best in the world on that topic and has created a unique process and everything with bio cybernaut. So for me, that was a huge game changer. And I think I've still noticed some of the benefits and I even credit a lot of the evolution and, and transformation that I've experienced over the last two years to BioCybernaut. And I think also in conjunction with my ayahuasca journeys that I did at Solterra in Costa Rica. So uh, will I be going back for sure? I'd also like to try, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd also like to try 40 Years of Zen, uh, which is, uh, it's um, what's his name? Dave Asprey's program. Uh, so 40 years of Zen is similar to bio cybernaut. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was powerful there. There's such a great community of people and, you know, people that do this sort of work that, uh, for me, it was definitely worthwhile. And I, I do plan to go back at some point. Okay. One, one says, I noticed you measured your heavy metal toxicity on a video. Have you gone through any chelation process? Or chelation process? If so, what would you recommend? Yes, I've actually done some videos on that. That was a few years ago. Um, detoxing lead and mercury from my body. Um, uh, the guy that I followed, what's his name? He has a, a really good protocol. You know, if you if you if you go back on my YouTube videos and you type in mercury or you know search for like heavy metals or whatever. You'll find the videos that I did talking about the chelation process that I went through. Uh, I first started doing an IV chelation, but that's actually not the best way of going about it because using the IV chelation, um, the metals can, can kind of swindle around your bloodstream and then get reabsorbed and cross the, the blood brain barrier and go to your brain. And, um, so there's a specific protocol that I followed. I just don't remember the person's name, but you can find it if you look back at those videos. Or, or the blog post too. If you go to projectlifemastery.com, go to the blog, you could search. I have, you know, some articles and blog posts I did and I, I mentioned the person. I want to I want to say it's Andy Andy Cutler, maybe. Let me let me just do a search. Andy Cutler. Yep. Oh wow. A good memory that I have. Andy Cutler. Andy Cutler protocol. Look that up. There's also a Facebook group too. So join the, uh, there's like a Facebook group that I was a part of. And that part of that protocol is using two supplements, DMSA, and I think another one, alpha lipoic acid, I think. And it's not easy because it requires taking these supplements like every few hours, including while you sleep. You have to wake, you know, I was waking up in the middle of the night to take these supplements every four hours or so. That was the best and the safest way that I, I, I discovered. 
All right. Uh, question from Dano, Danovic. What are your ambitions around longevity and what actions do you take to maximize on this? Yeah. You know, my ambition is just to live as long as I possibly can. I mean, I can't tell you how long that I'll live and, you know, sometimes God has different plans than what I, you know, I might intend, but I just try to do everything that I can and what I can control to take care of my body. Um, I've always been willing to invest in my health. I think that's one of the most important areas of life that one can invest in. Um, for me, being the richest man in the graveyard is not the goal. I want to make sure, more importantly, that I, you know, that I live a long period of time, but I also have a quality of life as I get older. So if I can live to a hundred, you know, even beyond that, which you know might be a possibility, um, if I can live to those levels, but not be this hunched over, immobile old man, but actually be a man who, at the age of a hundred, let's say, is still fit and active and you know, my mental performance is still there and all of that, then that would be the ultimate goal. So things that I do to maximize that is my sleep, uh, optimizing that as much as I can, which is, you know, a bigger topic we can go into my diet and the foods that I eat and the supplements that I take to the water that I drink, to the water that I shower in and bathe in, you know, using water filters and, uh, ionization devices and whatnot to my, habits of exercise and getting sunlight and going to the gym and moving my body to, um, to also all the biohacking stuff that I do. So I've got a lot of equipment that I have that, um, you know, such as a PEMF mat, uh, the nano V, um, you know, I've got, uh, an inversion table hang upside down on that to a vibration plate. I mean, you name it, I've got a lot of different stuff that I've invested in that, um, I believe can make a small difference and maybe not a big difference today or tomorrow, but a small impact on my body day after day, month after month, year after year, that ultimately all of these things that I do will make a big impact in terms of where I'll be physically in my life as I get older. So, um, yeah, I'm always open to anything that can enhance my health and my body, you know, things like intermittent fasting I do, um, Sometimes I do juice fasts or different cleanses throughout the year. So yeah, I'm just trying to optimize myself the best way I can. Um, but also, you know, giving myself permission to also enjoy different foods and things as well. So I'm not as, uh, I'm not as anal, I guess, about everything all the time, but ultimately I make sure that, you know, 90% of how I live my life and what I eat and do is in support of uh, a good, healthy life. Okay. Kalani says, hi, Stefan. I used to be so ambitious, but I am now with a great partner who provides for me and spoils me. How do I get that hunger back to pursue my goals again? I feel stuck. Thank you. All right. Well, Kalani, I think, you know, maybe you just have to find a new, uh, a new why or a new purpose for achieving goals. You know, the, the, the problem with, uh, using money as a motivator is money is, this tangible object you know, that's important in our society that people desire and they want. And so there's a motivation that one can have towards money and success because they don't yet have that. And money can provide for them in different ways, give them freedoms, allow you to spoil yourself, et cetera. So that can be a useful motivator at a certain stage of one's life, but it's not a sustainable motivator because what happens when you have money? What happens when you've already achieved success and you've already got everything that, you know, you could buy for yourself. You've exhausted all of your ego desires at a certain point that motivation wears off. That motivation is no longer useful for you. You know, I know for me at the stage that I'm in, I, I can't, you know, get motivated just to make some more money. Cause I know at this stage, more money isn't really going to do much for me. You know, more money is just going to be more money in a bank account, a stock, real estate, that I'll probably never touch. That'll probably be inherited to my kids or grandkids. Um, you know, you can only drive in one car at a time. You can only live in one place at a time. So at a certain point, having two cars and three cars and four cars, and those things aren't really going to give you that same motivation when you're already in a place of abundance and success and having everything that you wanted. So Kalani, the challenge for you is you, you've kind of gotten a lot of these needs taken care of, but you're trying to get motivated, but the way that you were motivated before is no longer going to work. You have to find a new uh, method of getting motivated. And 
that might be more doing something and pursuing something and being ambitious for something more based on what your passion is or something you really enjoy, or maybe it's something that is a, a, a service that you can provide for the world. So maybe there's a problem in the world that you want to help solve or be a part of the solution. You know, you want to make an impact in people's lives. Those are ways of being motivated that are going to be more sustainable for you, right? So you have to just, you know, find what that might be. You have to, um, you know, maybe the things that you pursue don't make you any money at all. Maybe it's like a nonprofit thing that you do. Uh, maybe it's, you know, pursuing art uh, or music or, you know, some other hobbies or other sports. And, you know, ambition does not always have to manifest as a way to make money. You know, you don't want to live your whole life doing things to make money. You want to live your life doing things because you want to do them and you enjoy doing them and it's a passion or it could be a great service, right? So there's, there's many things you might do. Like, you know, you could, you could be really, you know, put your, um, your time and your energy into art or music or starting some sort of nonprofit or something that doesn't give you any financial rewards, but it, fills your spirit. It fills you emotionally. And it's something that you have a passion for. That's the greatest, I think, luxury and benefit of becoming financially free is with financial freedom, you have freedom, you have time. You no longer have to work 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours a week. You have the time to now do truly what you want to do. You don't have to think about money, worry about money. You can spend your time doing all the things that you said you're going to do one day once you made it. So I think for you, Kalani, I, what I'd recommend is revisit what your vision is for your life, what you want for your life. What is that life going to look like in 10 years from now? What excites you about life at this chapter of where you are right now? Maybe, you know, you have a partner that provides for you. I don't know your level of relationship with them, but if it's a, a dating or a casual relationship, you're not married with a family, well, maybe one, one of your ambitions or motivations to have your own personal security and independence you know, so maybe that is something that can motivate you. But, you know, if this is your your husband, your wife, your life partner, you know, you guys are set financially and they spoil you and provide for you, that's a great place to be. And it allows you to now to focus on all the other things and aspects of life that maybe you've neglected or maybe, you know, can give you a lot of meaning and fulfillment. Maybe it's really taking care of your body, you know, doing some things for your, your fitness. Maybe it's really cultivating your relationship or your friendships with people. So, I think I just got to find what that is and just don't let money always be the motivator in your life. I think it can be useful at a stage of your life, but in the context of already, Hey, Hey, relax. Kobe is like trying to, um, <laughs> dig on the hardwood floor. Okay, bud, come come here. I know, I know, I know. Okay. Why don't you say hi to the camera? Come here, come here. Up. Up. Oh, oh. It's okay. It's okay. We'll live. All right. He's getting a little bit antsy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Mick Garrett says, any advice? Uh, what I can do against my depression. I feel like everything is going against me. Health, relationship, job, being alone all the time. I'm just so sick of life. Any books or any advice? Uh, yes, McGarrett. Uh, so I have a lot of compassion and love that I send your way, brother. Um, I think there's a few things I can share for you. One is this idea of depression. Um, one of the dangers that I think people can have with mental health conditions is that they identify with the condition and they believe that this is something that's permanent and pervasive in their life. And so the danger of saying I'm depressed is that, or even, I'm experiencing depression is that you become identified with it. And we human beings will do anything to remain consistent with our identity, what we identify with. So in a way, by using this label of depression, you're also creating a limitation for yourself to be anything other than that. 
And when you take on a belief like I'm depressed, oftentimes the way the mind works is it looks for ways to reinforce that belief system and to support that belief so it gets stronger and stronger and therefore also harder for you to become free of. And the same thing would be said for anxiety or any other emotional state. Something like depression or anxiety, these are emotional experiences that every human being can relate to to some extent. One key aspect that I've learned is when I experience an emotion, to not label it, but to instead focus on the symptoms of it. So for example, depression, what, what are the sensations that you can become aware of in your body? You know, maybe you feel a heaviness, maybe you feel, uh, you know, maybe you feel your, your palms sweating, or maybe you feel, um, tension in your stomach, you know, or maybe you feel, you know, you're, you're, you know, if you have anxiety, maybe your, your, your legs go, go weak and tremble or something like that. Those are sensations that you want to focus on allowing them to come up and be without having the mind getting involved and labeling it and identifying with it and even trying to fix or change it. So really what you want to do, and what I've learned, it, this is the letting go technique, which I did a video about a few months ago, I recommend that you watch, is as this emotion arises, these symptoms arise in your body, resist the temptation to label and identify with it. Instead, just bring your awareness to it and to let it be, let it flow through you. Because every emotional experience is temporary and transitory. This is the big realization that the Buddha had is that they're impermanent. They come and they go. They're like clouds in the sky. You know, right now in the sky, there could be a lot of dark clouds and rain and thunderstorms. But if you just sit there and you observe, then sure enough, that storm will pass and there'll be clear, beautiful, sunny sky. The sun is always there, regardless of the clouds and everything that's there. And it's the same thing with yourself. Happiness, joy is there at all times. Hey, relax, Kobe. Um, so that's kind of a... A, med a mindfulness process that I think is really valuable. And, um, you know, one of the theories that exists is that emotions like depression, anxiety are suppressed emotions that are arising, but the more that you resist it and sweep it under the carpet, ignore it, put it aside or whatever it is, the more that it will persist because whatever you resist will persist. And so if you just allow it to come and it could be uncomfortable, even it could be distressing. If you just allow yourself to sit with that emotion, it will pass and you're releasing and letting go a lot of that uh, suppressed and repressed emotion that's there. So that's one practice that I would recommend you get into. Uh, books I can share with you on this would be uh, the book, Letting Go by Dr. David Hawkins, uh, the book, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. And the book, The Sedona Method. Sedona Method, in fact, uh, open up on YouTube, type in YouTube, type in, uh, let's see, what's it called? A letting Go Documentary, I think. Letting Go Documentary. Yeah. Okay. If you go to YouTube, guys, and type in Letting Go, The Sedona Method Movie, I'd recommend watching that. And, and just that's a good introduction. It's about an hour long and eight minutes. It's a good introduction to the Sedona method, the letting go technique. And then from there, you can get into, you know, uh, you know, the other books that I recommended. I, I, I think that's one of the most important processes that I do in my life is this letting go technique and it works for everything. Um, David Hawkins, I also like his map of consciousness. Uh, one of my favorite books by him is called transcending the levels of consciousness and what you'd be describing if you're in depression is a lower level of consciousness on the map, which has different levels and experiences, but it'd be one of apathy. And in that level of apathy, depression, um, he shares how to transcend beyond that. And one of the reasons why 12 step programs work for those that are, have addictions like Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12 step programs is Oftentimes, people that are at a very low level of consciousness and they're in that kind of state, they need a di divine intervention. They need a, a spiritual experience to help them pull themselves above that. Um, even if you look at Bill Wilson, the founder of AA and the 12 Steps, 
you know, he had some experiences using LSD and psychedelics and, you know, um, the spiritual aspects of that is what brought him to a higher state of consciousness. And so the, the book transcending the levels of consciousness, I think is really powerful and I think can really benefit you because you'll be able to read about in each chapter, the level that you are at and how to transcend that to a higher level of consciousness and to eventually bring yourself up out of your depression. Um, I think also the, the, the challenge with depression is, and anxiety or any mental health is sometimes, you know, people give the advice, like just exercise, you know, or do, you know, get out there and do this or that. But the thing with depression is that you feel paralyzed. Like you feel like I can't even get out of bed. I can't even get myself to go to the gym or do these things. So part of it also, I think is having compassion for yourself, for the experience that you're going through. Um, and just take those baby steps and set yourself up to win. So if you struggle going to the gym, then how can you make it as easy as possible for yourself? Maybe you make a goal every day. I'm just going to get out of the house. You know, if I just get out of the house, even if it's for five minutes, then that's a win. And I'm going to celebrate that. Uh, and then maybe you push it, you know, a little bit further. I'm going to go for a walk every day. I'm going to go for a walk for, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever is an amount that's doable for you. Because if you, if you set a goal for yourself in a depressive state that I'm going to go out and work out for an hour and go for an hour run, which without a doubt will help your depression. There's a lot of you know research that shows that exercise is a powerful antidepressant. The challenge is you might not do it. So instead, set yourself up to win. Set small, achievable goals. I'm going to go for a 15-minute walk. And then you build yourself from there. I'm going to start a journal. I'm going to you know journal my experience and the emotions that I have. I'm going to start a meditation practice. Maybe you just start with one minute a day or do you meditate for 30 seconds? Whatever it is to set yourself up to win. So I think... When it comes to mental health, depression, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's no shortage of that. And if you read books and you know, re watch videos and study this, there's many things that you can do to help you with your depression. I, I mentioned earlier psychedelics in this uh, stream that we did. Uh, you know, I've mentioned you know, obviously exercise and diet, all these things you can do that without a doubt will help you. But you have to have compassion for yourself and just slowly get yourself to do these things. And you have to start to change your mind in a simple way, which is to look for and train your mind to look at the good, to look at the positive aspects of your life. Uh, because a few things that you said in your comment, um, let me pull, pull it up. You said, I feel like everything is going against me. So is that a true statement? No, everything is not going against you. Health, relationship, job, being alone all the time. I'm just so sick of life. So you've, you've in a way, lost touch with the truth and the reality of your existence on this planet. You're taking for granted completely the gift and the privilege that you have of number one, actually being alive. Okay. This is an idea that we take for granted, but it's so precious. Do you realize how rare it is to be born a human being? In fact, the Buddha believed that the fact that you're born as a human being is the result of good karma. So that's a great thing. Wow. Whether you believe in karma or not, which I don't know if it exists or not, but let's just say that, let's say the idea of whatever you, uh, whatever you sow, you reap in life, which I think everybody can agree with, you know, you do, do good in the world and good is going to come back to you, but that's a great thing. Maybe in a previous lifetime or who knows what God loved you enough. You're here. You've been given this gift. That's incredibly rare and is special and precious. Not only that, but you could also be grateful for the fact that you're alive during the greatest time to be alive throughout history. You're alive in this world, a modern world, where there's technology, there's advances in medicine, in science. There's certain comforts and opportunities that are available for you that never existed before throughout history. So that that's an amazing thing. I mean, that's an incredible gift that you could be appreciative of and just really take in is the fact that you're not only alive, but you're alive in a day and age where there's so much abundance and opportunity. And you're also alive during a place where you have access to technology 
I mean, the fact that you have a computer, a phone, whatever it is that you're engaging with me on, that's an incredible gift that you can appreciate. You know, there's, did you know there's people in, in parts of the world that don't have that? They don't have a device, a phone that they can take out and they can watch a video like this, or they can find the answers to any problem that they, they, they want. They can go to Google. They can, there's so much information resources that can help you in your life that other people don't have access to. So I've heard, I've heard this and I don't know if I fully agree with it or not, but I've heard from some people where they've said that depression is a luxury. And what they mean by that is that when you're in a survival mode, you don't have the luxury of being depressed. So for example, if you, you know, one of the reasons, let's say if you go to some countries and they live in a tribal village, um, and they don't experience depression or these mental health issues is because they don't have the luxury to be depressed, to sit around depressed. When you are focused on survival needs and you need to have shelter, you need to have food, you need to hunt, you need to gather, you, you know, regardless of how you feel, you still go and do these things. I think that a lot of these mental health conditions and depression uh, is the product of a modern world that we live in where, you know, you can just sit, you know, even behind a screen and watch things and play video games. And, you know, it's, it, you know, you're comfortable in your life to some degree or extent, and you can kind of sit around maybe and experience that depression. So I think understand that there's so much you can be grateful for and that you can appreciate and you've lost sight of that. And I think a simple, another simple practice for anybody here that's going through a rough time is have a gratitude journal every day. Just train yourself. What are five or 10 things that I'm grateful for today? Things that you never thought of before, things that you, you're, you're taking for granted because there's so much that's there. I mean, you, yes, your health might not be ideal and maybe you're going through a health challenge, but there's people out there that have no arms, no legs. There's people out there that, you know, uh, are blind, you know, and deaf. And yet, regardless of their physical handicap, they're joyous in life. They're grateful for their life. They have an amazing quality of life because life is what you decide it to be. Um, in fact, I'll throw out some names for you guys, uh, two or three people that I think will inspire you, that will also show you whatever your problems are, that you have no problems. There's always people worse off than you. And oftentimes there's people that are worse off that regardless of that are still happy and joyous. Okay. So one name would be, I always mispronounce it, Nick. Okay. I'm going to throw it in the chat for you guys. Nick Vucevic. Vucevic. Totally probably butchered his name. And let me throw it here in the chat. So, all right, let me. Okay, so that's his name. Look him up on YouTube. Read his books. He has no arms and no legs, and he's a motivational speaker, and he's incredibly inspiring. And you know what? He's been through rock bottom, depression, and wanted to kill himself. And so if someone, based on his circumstances, can be joyous and happy, then that is something that could be an inspiration for you. Uh, another one is Sean Stevenson. He actually passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was you know, a guy in a wheelchair who was born with a genetic condition. He had broken every bone in his body, I think, like multiple times, like really rough physical handicap. And yet he did not allow his circumstances to define him. He was able to rise above it. And I guess the last example, I mean, there's many out there that if you search for it can inspire you is Helen Keller. You know, Helen Keller who is deaf and blind and is, you know, regardless of that, has one of the most incredible mindsets that I've come across in studying people that have amazing mentalities and mindsets. So there's examples like that that I encourage you and everyone to find and look for. And what makes them happy and joyous is their mindset, their belief system. And no matter what you're going through, depression, anxiety, which is no joke, I don't diminish it in any way, I always believe and hold the possibility and the vision for everybody that they can be free from that, that joy, happiness, passion, these are experiences that exist for everybody. They're possible for everybody. They're not, you know, it's, they're not just for the select few. You, you can have and be and experience that. You can solve any problem or challenge that you're going through. 
You just have to find the examples. You have to implement the habits. You've got to celebrate. You got to change your mindset. You got to focus on what you're grateful for. You got to implement all this to the best of your ability. And it might take time. It may take a long time, but you will get there. I truly believe that. And in a position where you do heal, whatever it is, because you know maybe there's traumas and other things that you need to address. But on that other side, you can be an inspiration and a role model for so many people. So I truly believe that for you, McGarrett, and send you my love. And I know it, you know, I've been through depression. I've been through hard times like that. And, uh, you know, sounds like you're doing a lot of awesome things. Amazing. Amazing. Keep going, my friend, keep going, you know, bright days are ahead. Uh, read some of the books that I recommended, you know, it's just a lifelong journey in your life. Um, you know, for me, the work with David Hawkins, I've been really enjoying a lot. Um, I'll share with you guys uh, one more. If, if, for those of you, I, I recommend his books, um, but he has a lot of lectures as well, which I'm not sure if everybody is really ready for, and you know, not everyone's ready for this spiritual content and whatnot. Uh, Varietispub.com. Uh, so that David Hawkins passed away in 2012, but uh, you know, on that website there, you can subscribe, and it's. 20 bucks a month to get access to all of his streaming lectures, all, all of his lectures and his Q and A's and whatnot. And he, uh, you know, if you're not much of a reader, then you could watch some of those and take in some of his content. But for me, it's because I've read his books that I think maybe I get more out of his lectures because it can seem maybe a little bit too deep, uh, for some people, but you know, go in with an open mind and see if it resonates with you. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that are at your disposal and, Hopefully, um, you know, you take advantage of some of that and get into a, a much better place. Okay, my friends, we're going to wrap it up because we've gone over two, two hours now. Um, it was always uh, a pleasure to spend this time with you guys and to connect and hopefully share some inspiration and some value for you guys. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the stream, this is uh, a recording that you can come back to if you'd like, if you'd like to rewatch it, I'll leave it up here for you guys. Um, uh, for those of you that are interested in the crypto, I'll throw that link here for you guys. Uh, projectlifemastery.com slash crypto. So uh, for those of you that are interested in that or just want to learn more about it or maybe you're already experiencing crypto and you want to learn how you know how to make some extra passive income with it, then check out that link. Um, we're doing a webinar on Saturday and um, there should be a replay for that as well. But you guys can learn more there. Um, of course, crypto is not for everybody. There's risks with crypto also. So be aware of that. But uh, that's one of the ways that I've been making money and uh, just one strategy that I use to diversify my port portfolio and everything. Um, otherwise, you know, I'll probably have some videos for you guys, you know, later this month and, um, you know, might do another one of these streams. Tell Kobe's getting a little grumpy. He wants my attention now. <laughs> Uh, okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. I wish you guys uh, an amazing rest of your day and week, and we'll talk again soon. God bless.